Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first forum of the spring semester. Uh, my name is Alice Kayami, and I'm a sophomore in the college studying applied math and a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Before we, get, we begin, please take a moment to note the two exit doors, one on the park side and one on JFK street side. In the event of an emergency, please congregate in JFK Park. Please also take a moment to silence your cell phones um, and join me in welcoming our two new co-chairs of the JFK Junior Forum Committee, Robert Fogel and Ryan Tierney. Thank you, Alice. Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and welcome to the JFK Junior Forum. Uh, my name is Ryan Tierney, uh, and I'm a junior at the college studying history, literature, and economics. Uh, and I'm Robert Fogel. I'm a sophomore at the college studying economics and government. We are so excited to welcome you all to the first panel of 2023. The Forum is a special place on Harvard's campus, a day where free dialogue and exchange of ideas are constantly challenged where divisiveness and polarization have become the norm and democratic institutions abroad and at home have come under threat. We strive to counter these trends. By engaging our students in conversations with the world's leaders to discuss the lessons of the past, the problems of the present, and the opportunities of the future, we hope to prepare our students for a life of leadership and imbue them with a dedication to the common good. We hope that you will enjoy this evening's discussion enjoying us in the future for a full semester of forums. Now, please join me in welcoming the two co-chairs of the Fellows in Study Groups, Liz Benecki and Sebastian ramirez Fume. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for being here. My name is Sebastian ramirez Fune and I'm a sophomore in Dunster House studying government. Hi everyone, my name is Liz Benecki. I'm a sophomore at the college studying government and women and gender studies, and Sebastian and I are the co-chairs of the Fellows and Study Groups program here at the IOP. The Fellows and Study Groups program means something different for everyone, whether they be student or fellow. And if you've read our program description, then you know that FSG is a space to learn from the greatest voices in politics and public service. But many members, and for the people in this room, for all of us, FSG's impact goes beyond just these conversations. FSG has taught students the importance of civility and open mind and respectful disagreement. This semester, our fellows will aim to expand our perspectives, promote self-reflection, and enable us to engage with the most pressing issues of our current political moment. Please visit the IOP website to learn more about study groups, times, and office hours. These opportunities are open to any Harvard community member, and it is now our pleasure to introduce our six resident fellows for the 2023 spring cohort. Yay, Nega Anka is an associate vice president with the Cohen Group and brings nearly two decades of experience advising the US Department of State and National Security Council leadership on matters of policy development and strategic communication. Nega's study group will focus on questions and dilemmas in the practice of contemporary diplomacy and statecraft. Kristen Emerling is a congressional oversight expert who has served in the senior council positions on congressional committees and in the executive branch. In 2021, she was chief counsel and deputy staff director to the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. Kristen's study group will examine the constitutional investigative powers of Congress and how to best use those powers to promote effective governance. Jason Rezaian writes for the Washington Post's Global Opinion section. Previously, he was the Post's Tehran bureau chief from 2012 to 2016, and in 2014, he was arrested by an Iranian authorities and imprisoned for 544 days until his release in January 2016. Jason will lead a study group focused on international journalism. Now, from 2011 to 2022, Congre Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler served as the U.S. representative for the Southwest Washington's third congressional district, where she was 
a nine-year member of the powerful House Appropriations Committee, ranking member of the Subcommittee on the Legislative Branch, member of the Joint Economic Committee, and a lead voice in Health, Energy, and Financial Services Subcommittees. Congresswoman Herrera Butler's study group will focus on putting country over party and governing in a divided America. Quentin Folks is a nationally recognized campaign manager and political strategist, advising some of the largest, most expensive, and most consequential campaigns for American politics. Folks served as campaign manager for the 2022 re-election campaign for Senator Reverend Raphael Warnock in his home state of Georgia. Quentin's study group will focus on modern political campaigning. Last, but certainly not least, Matthew Raymer is a chief counsel at the Republican National Committee leading the RNC's legal efforts nationwide. A leading political law attorney, Matt previously served as the general counsel at the National Republican Senatorial Committee for the 2016 cycle and at the Republican State Leadership Committee from 2017 to 2020. Matthew's study group will take on an in-depth look at the national political party committees and the challenges they face heading into the 2024 presidential election cycle. As you all can see, we are so fortunate and so excited to have these wonderful fellows here with us this semester on campus. We are so excited to work with you all. And now we'd like to pass the mic off to our interim director of the Institute of Politics, Seti Warren, who will be moderating the discussion for tonight. Thank you all for being here, and we hope to see you on L163 and L166. Thank you, student chairs. Um, it's great to be with you. Good evening. How, are, how is everyone? <laughs> little energy with the Arctic air out there. Um, before we begin, I want to thank a few groups of people that make forums happen. Since we're at the start of the semester, a lot of times you don't see these people because they're doing work behind the scenes. First, I want to thank the people that actually construct this auditorium. As you all know, this is not what it looks like during the day, right? So the chairs, the staging, and the like. The second group I want to thank are the folks that do the sound. They work really hard at making sure we're amplified. Um, I'd like to thank the security uh, folks here. And I also want to thank the forum staff, our mighty team of two, and the <laughs> IOP staff. And finally, I want to thank the students. They did a terrific job in helping to select this fellow's class. And I want to thank the forum committee that helped actually make uh, student form committee that actually make these forms happen. Please give them a round of applause. They're all <laughs> important players. They're all important players. So we're going to jump right into this uh, head first. Um, I want to turn to Quentin and Matthew first um, to ask them a couple of questions. Uh, Quentin, you were in a heck of a race down there in Georgia. My goodness. Um, what does that race mean and the outcome for is I'd like you to give us sort of a landscape of the 2024 presidential election through your lens. And then, Matthew, um, you had quite a contentious election uh, at the RNC recently. Um, what does that mean um, in regard to the state of the Republican Party? Um, and I'd, second, uh, what does the future look like? Lastly, I'd love for you to give sort of a landscape view of the 2024 presidential. So. I'll let you fully uh, tackle those. Want me to go first? Sure. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a four-part question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so, so first of all, um, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, and thank you, Seti, for the question. Uh, you know, the race in Georgia, I think what is important is that we're in this academic setting. Uh, it shows that what we talk about and what we teach uh, and what we're trying to, I hope, to relay in my study group uh, is that campaigns matter. Uh, and that's not to say that, that they don't, but it's regardless of how partisan or, or you know, sort of rigid the electorate is, uh, voters are complex. Um, they're listening. Uh, and people have gone through a lot over the last couple of years with COVID, um, but they really care about who represents them. And I think that you, know, you, you sort of see this trend with um, the global Congress numbers. 
you know, dwindling in popularity, but like super popular elected officials uh, in the states. Uh, and I think if you run a campaign that is really talking to voters and sort of meeting voters where they are, you can overcome um, some of the partisan divide that's in our country and, you know, make no mistake about it right now, there's a lot going on, right? Uh, there's abortion, there's immigration, Title 42, um, there's still COVID, there's climate change, there's issues of race, there's religion. Uh, and so we have a lot of things to overcome. Uh, and so what I'm most proud of about what we were able to accomplish in Georgia is the fact that we were able to tackle each one of those issues in real time, um, voting rights included, uh, and, and honestly take the second most rigid election in the rigid uh, electorate in the United States uh, and bend it by nine points uh, to get them to vote for Senator Warnock. And so that to me, uh, going into the second part of your question, uh, is what I sort of see in 2024 is that, you know, it is going to be tough um, for, for everyone running. Uh, we have Donald Trump, former President Trump, is an anomaly. Uh, no one really understands how he impacts uh, the electorate. And, and then you see a more um, uh, moderate version of him, but, but a better politician in terms of how we think of it in DeSantis if he decides to get in. Uh, and then on the Democratic side, you just have President Biden, which I think everybody is rightfully so waiting to see uh, what he decides to do. Uh, but if he does decide to run, I am a Democrat, but if he does decide to run, I think that, you know, what we were able to do this year sort of translates and lets him know um, that this is a winnable electorate and people are paying attention. My turn. Great. Well, well thank you so much, Sadie. It's so wonderful to be here. I spend the day getting to know fellow resident fellows and it's just it's a terrific group and I'm really honored to be a part of it so thank you for having me. Um, let me start off by saying that of course anything I say while I'm here I'm currently the chief counsel of the RNC so this is me talking this is I'm not speaking on behalf of the RNC or, or, or anything like that. Uh, <laughs> your, your first question I think, think was about um, the election that we just had and so for those of you who do not follow uh, the ins and outs of RNC officer elections uh, I had the joy of spending the last month uh, two or so and last week in particular um, in Dana Point where we had a, uh, I would say by our RNC standards, an extraordinarily tense and acrimonious election to see who'd be the next chair of the RNC and, and uh, fill some other officer roles as well. Um, the result of that was uh, Ron McDaniel being elected to a fourth term as chairman, uh, which makes her the longest serving RNC chair since the Civil War. Um, and uh, I think arguably one of its most consequential. Um, there's a couple different ways to look at that. And one way is you could look at uh, that election happening and some of the stuff that was said um, and uh, say that it shows that we're disunified or Republicans are in disarray. Another way you can look at that is that there are a lot of Republican people who, right now who really care about the direction of the party and really want to have their opinions known. And, and, and because they also really care about the future of the country um, and, and, and want to take part in, in shaping that. So I try to look at it as a positive thing. Uh, and I hope that the party can move forward and put its sights on 2024. And I think, uh, you know, frankly, the RNC, the party is in a really good position to do the kinds of things that we need to do to help elect a Republican uh, to take back the Senate and expand our majority in the House. Um, but it's gonna, take, it's gonna take all of us working hard um, and getting back to the things that, that make us the party that we've, we've been for a long time. And if I could just ask, like, I'm just honestly kind of curious, uh, as far as engagement, we're gonna talk a lot about engagement. How many people here have ever been to a meeting of their state political party, whatever your party is? Okay, a few. How many people have been to a meeting of your county political party? That's actually more than I expected, but I think I'm counting like five, right? So when you talk about political parties and you talk about uh, politics in this country, I think it's really important to remember that the future belongs to the people who show up. And it belongs to the people who are gonna put in the work, who are, are going to take part in the stuff that's not fun, who are going to show up on a monthly basis and, and, and you know, talk to, you know, hear candidates out and you know, hold signs on the street corners and things like that and, and volunteer on election day. Um, and so I would just really encourage you all to, to do that and look for ways to do that if that is something that you care about. So as far as who, who does the future Republican Party belong to, it belongs to the people who are gonna show up. Well said, thank you for that. Um, this one, next one's for Naga and Jason. Um, Naga, I know you've been doing a lot of work in protecting democracies from around the world. Um, I'm wondering how our domestic politics affects our ability to conduct diplomacy um, and our ability to promote democracy around the world. And for you, sorry, I was gonna ask both of you, I made a mistake there. Jason, for you, um, 
Can you give us sort of a state of play in Iran, what is happening there? And then second, can real change happen? So those are the two. I'm glad I'm not taking that question. <laughs> um, well, first, I, I just want to say thank you. Um, just to echo, I'm, I'm honored to be on this stage with such amazing public servants, um, and, and it's an honor to be here. So in terms of, of, of democracy, I think we would want to take a step back and think about sort of the, the trends that are happening right now globally. Um, we're seeing populism, we're seeing nationalism, we're seeing authoritarianism. Authoritarianism isn't new, um, but we're seeing democratic backsliding uh, around the world. And I think that is one of the most concerning factors that we need to pay attention to. So um, I had the privilege uh, to, to work on and create the, the Summit for Democracy uh, that President Biden hosted um, December of 2021. And it was a true reflection of the time of where we are in the world and sort of where we are between democracy versus autocracy um, and where is the various um, sort of thinking of the various generations in terms of, you know, are you going to vote for, for democracy or are you going to go towards this path of, of authoritarianism? Um, and of course, you know, you see this rise of, of nationalism that's popping up around the world, whether it was um, vaccines um, and, and sort of that sort of concept or Brexit, which was um, filling the, the airwaves. Um, and so just to make a, a bit of a plug uh, for, for my um, study group, uh, we are going to look at the future of, of democracy. We're going to look at the future of diplomacy. What does that mean? Um, so taking away from the, the traditional sense of looking at the various regions of, of the world, but looking at sort of tech and democracy, where is cybersecurity in terms of diplomacy and statecraft? Um, so when we think about democracy, it's not just your, your, your traditional set of factors. There's so many of these other components um, that are at play. And, and quite frankly, um, when we think about uh, US politics, I mean, it is now very global. You can, you can sit anywhere in the world and you will see what is playing out in, in US politics. Um, in, in conversations, you can be sitting in, in a taxi. Um, in the middle of Cairo, you could be in, in a village in the middle of Morocco, and you will see images um, coming uh, through, through TV or, or conversations that you're having. And so we have to take that into account um, that everything is now local and yet global at the same time. Thank you. Jason? Yeah, I mean, just to piggyback <coughs> off of that before uh, I answer, your question, even in a prison cell in Iran where I had access to Iran's state television, American politics was top of the news 24-7. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole world looks to us, even our adversaries. Um, I was at a, an event in Tehran in 2011 to commemorate the anniversary of the Islamic Republic. Uh, happens on February 11th every year. And um, I don't want to get into too much about linguistics, but uh, there is no concept of a double, double negative in, in, uh, in the Persian language. And they had put one of Ayatollah Khomeini's uh, main slogans into a Google Translate, I think, and there, there was a big banner at this event that said, America can do no wrong. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, they're burning the stars. back to Iran again people have asked me repeatedly um, is this time different I mean we've seen uprisings in Iran um, most uh, notably in 2009 again in 2017 2019 truth is people have been protesting the Islamic Republic since the day that it started um, we just have different windows into that society now because of social media um, that, that, than we have in the past. What's different this time around is the coalescing of many different types of groups of, of disenfranchised people within Iranian society. We all know that the protests started when a young Kurdish Iranian woman uh, was killed by security forces. Um, there is a lot of anger about that on a couple of scores. One thing we don't talk about is um, the progression of women in Iranian society over the last 40 years. 
that levels of education uh, have far out surpassed uh, that of their male counterparts, and the job opportunities and the income levels are not matching up. I mean, th these are you know issues we've dealt with in in America and, and in the West for many years, but in a much more acute way. I mean, in Iran, women are second-class citizens, as are non-Shia uh, minorities, Kurds, um, Arab Iranians, Azeris, and others. So you have all of these people very upset at the same time. Why are they upset? For a lot of reasons. One, because their rights aren't protected uh, in the same way that, that, that they would be if they were uh, Persian Shia males. Um, but also because the, the decline in the quality of life in Iran has been deteriorating uh, for over a decade. And people there just don't see a path uh, forward under the current system. So your second question, is real change possible? Yes, it is. Uh, but I would argue that the real uh, thing that we need to be talking he about here at the Kennedy School and that I talk with folks in Washington about a lot is what is it that we in the outside world can do to contribute to that change? Because it ain't going to happen by itself. Thank you. We're gonna, we have a lot to learn about uh, Iran and that society, so I think you'll be able to bring that uh, to us here. Um, I'm going to turn to uh, Congresswoman and Kristen. Um, Congresswoman, um, we just had a historic election for speaker recently um, with a number of days where people did not know what was going to happen next. Um, what does that mean for the next two years, politically, policy-wise? Uh, give us some insight into that, please. I and think, the, oh, and then I, one yeah. question for Kristen. Um, we've recently seen um, the political, politi the <laughs> weaponization, <laughs> I can't even say politicization, of uh, these um, investigative committees. And in recent years. So I'm, I'm curious to know what that means for the future of these committees. Um, can they be effective um, in the future? So we'll start with the Congressman, then we'll go to Kristen. Um, well, I think everybody had that same question over the first part of January. I was getting lots of calls and texts about what was going on um, and, and what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen. Um, I actually didn't, though it was more entertaining than it's been. It wasn't actually that different than, you know, two years ago uh, when we, and, and then four years ago when uh, Pelosi was kind of dealing with some similar things. She does it totally different. Um, I remember having a conversation with Steny Hoyer the night before swearing in and I was super upset. <laughs> I was like, Steny, why is there a, they had put a, it was COVID and at the time you had to be in person to vote. So there were members of the Democratic caucus who were called in to vote because her margin was so slim who had COVID or who were just recovering. And I, I was like, why are you, how could you possibly put people on a plane to get here? And they had like a plexiglass thing in the hall, in the, but everything was closed at that point. So nobody really knew what was happening. So when I saw this happening in January, I was like, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. I mean, there are some similarities there. So some things are always going to be chaotic. Um, but there's so much that's happening right now, and part of it is because we're such a divided government, which I think means it really it's a reflection of where we're at as the American people. We're very divided. And so, there, but there are big things that have to happen. The debt ceiling is going to be the first thing we're going to bump up against. Um, you know, I was an appropriator. Appropriations bills have to pass or the government shuts down. There's no kick in the can on that. Um, there'll be the NDAA, National Defense Authorization, which traditionally has been a bipartisan bill, regardless of who's in charge, and it passes every Congress, and then maybe a farm bill. All those things actually really do need to move. And there's many other things that need to move, but those are like, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big promoter, promoter of kids' health. There's some reauthorization in there with regard to training uh, kids' doctors. So there's a lot that needs to happen, and those are going to put pressure on, and it's going to be a wild and, and woolly <laughs> six months, year, until we start the, the campaign slog. 
So really, this is the year when stuff's going to move, and then everybody will kind of back up and, and wait for politics to, to take its course. But I'm excited to be here. I'm really excited to be with you all. I'm excited to hear your questions, hear what's like, intriguing to you, because we really, we're all here because we believe in what you're going to do, and as you step into your places of leadership, we need you. So we're excited to be a part of that. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Seti, and I also want to say I'm so excited to have the chance to participate in this community. I'm really looking forward to the next few months here. Um, to your question on the congressional investigative landscape, um, I would say I've had the good fortune to serve as a counsel on a number of investigations where members who had very divergent political views worked together to advance the goals of the investigation. Um, when I was uh, counsel to Representative Henry Waxman, and he was the leading Democrat on the House Oversight Committee, he worked very closely with then Republican Chair Tom Davis to examine um, allegations relating to Jack Abramov's contacts with the Bush White House. When the House majority changed and they flipped positions and Representative Waxman was chair, he again worked with then leading Republican on the committee, Tom Davis, to look at um, the health impacts of steroid use by teen athletes. And then most recently, I, I worked on the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the Capitol. And that was a committee um, where members' political perspectives ranged from conservative Republican to very liberal Democrat. And um, they succeeded in really working together to keep their eye on um, making sure that they got the facts right together. And I, I think what these experiences have illustrated for me is that um, you know, it, there is a lot of possibility for congressional oversight and investigations when members um, really have a, a shared spirit of collaboration. It, it also showed it takes a lot of work. I mean, th in the case of the select committee, you had to have uh, ongoing, respectful conversations. You had a skilled, um, tireless chair leading the committee. You had um, consistent, courageous leadership by the vice chair. And across the membership, you had uh, members of Congress who shared their focus on um, you know, putting the goals of the investigation above their individual interests. So um, I think that experience has been instructive about the, the promise for investigations. I've had the opposite um, experiences of counsel too. I've been on investigations where members had completely different views mm -hmm. of the significance of the facts and uh, there's been a lot of contentiousness. Um, but to your, to your question about uh, the, the current times, I mean, I think we're in a, in a very challenging um, polarized time and it's, it's hard to predict how it will play out. I'm really looking forward in my um, study group to having really rigorous discussions about um, how Congress can most effectively use its oversight powers, what are the potential um, negative consequences if those powers are abused, and um, we'll be looking in real time at how different investigations are unfolding. That's great, thank you. I'm gonna ask one more question of the group, but in the meantime, you can start lining up at the microphones for your questions. Um, there's four, two on the floor, two in the uh, balcony uh, there. And remember to, uh, remember this is a question. <laughs> Make sure it's a question <laughs> uh, when you go to the microphone. So we've all acknowledged the polarized times we're in. You've all commented on it. Um, it doesn't seem to be getting better. It seems to be getting worse. So. I'm wondering, and, and I'm going to let anyone that wants to field this, what is the pathway forward? You know, how do we get past this polarization? Um, and, you know, I was listening to you, Kristen. Liz Cheney was on the stage last semester. It was just remarkable in how she described her work with her Democratic counterparts. And when I was backstage, it's just a very genuine, just wanting to get to the truth, protect American democracy. So, but that doesn't seem to be growing, that kind of cooperation. So just really quick, anyone who wants to take that, what's the, what's the pathway forward? 
I, I think this is one of the things I want to talk about in my, in my session because I, I really truly believe we have to get back to the point where we have healthy <laughs> governing officials and part of that, most of the people there are there for the right reasons and they're working their tails off. Republican or Democrat. I have just as many strong Democrat uh, relationships, friends, people who call and text, as I did Republican. And that's a majority of the people there, and they're the ones who do actually, I would argue, save democracy. They're the ones who are gonna make sure that the government doesn't shut down. They're the ones who are gonna make sure um, you know, that these important pieces of legislation pass. They're not the ones you're gonna see on TV. They're not the clickbait, right? So I actually think, um, Making them, making that more available, and and helping people see that that's that's the route we need to go. I think we also need to just value one another. It's simple. It's 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 in everything. It's in class. It's in church. It's in school. Like you have to value the person that you're sitting across from. Doesn't mean you have to agree with them. You can passionately disagree, but you have to value them. And if we do that, I I think that's the only way out. Personally, that's my take. Anyone else want to join? In? I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'm a campaign guy, so I have to take the the, the opposite <laughs> approach. Uh, you know, I, I think you know it's voting. I, I, I think at the end of the day, look, I mean, we we routinely send people back to Washington D.C. who, who in states people don't feel like they're serving their interest, and you know, the best way to do that is to turn out and like. You know, I think when we look at it, every cycle, there's battleground states, right? If you look at the the RNC website or the DNC website, there's a list of states that they feel like they can flip. And it's the same ones every two years, every six years that keep coming. And I think that, you know, if, if people start engaging in those places, in those states, um, and, you know, showing up. And, and I, I mean, to that point, that, that doesn't mean just if you're a Democrat, win in Democratic states or get Democrats to win in Democratic places or, you know, battleground states. But it, it, it does mean listening, right? Like, you know, I, I think if we just sort of take a beat and try to find some common ground, it's very hard to do today with social media, mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the press, which, you know, again, I, I totally believe in free press, but it's very hard to do. And I think it's because we lock ourselves into those echo chambers, right? Like we're, we're looking at the MSNBC, we're looking at the mm -hmm. Fox News, uh, and we just literally can't stomach uh, any opposition to what we may personally believe, uh, and that just shuts down. But you know, for me, I personally think that the way forward is really expressing it to vote. Like you see, tons of people dissatisfied with Congress, like 20% approval rating for Congress. They keep the same retention rate for electing their members every two years. It doesn't make any sense, and the only reason I can think of that is because people aren't turning out to vote. Great. Thank you for that. Let's start over here, and also say your. Harvard affiliation when you, before you ask the question. Yes. Um, well, hello, fellows. Thank you for joining us today. Um, FSG holds a special place in my heart. Um, my name is Nadia Douglas. I'm a junior at the college studying, uh, double concentrating in government and sociology. Junior at the college studying, uh, double concentrating in government and sociology. Um, and my question is for Naga. Um, my focus is in like racial representation in our international systems. Um, so my question for you is racial and ethnic tension is a global phenomenon um, that's grown increasingly, increasingly salient in recent time, especially here in the US. Yet I have yet to see a multilateral approach or coalition to address adequate representation on an international level. Um, but in your career, you've had many spaces of, of um, multilateralism, of these discussions and debates. So how have you approached conversation of inclusion in senior international roles and ensured that your meetings were truly encompassing all groups and stakeholders? Thank you for that question. That's actually a great question. Um, and, and actually one of the things that the study group will bring is these lived experiences, whether it's my own lived experiences or of, of, of my guests. Um, I think it's very important. I think, for example, just using the Summit for Democracy as an example, it was very important that there was diversity of voices at the table in any of those conversations that were taking place. There was a concerted effort to make sure that it wasn't a mantle. Um, there was a concerted effort to ensure that there were voices from all across the globe because democracy is not a one-size-fits-all. Um, I think one of the things that the U.S. government does well is to ensure that we don't um, have delegations going out that are just purely purely male. Um, we want to make sure that there is female representation. There are quite a bit of studies that show um, women uh, engage in negotiations very differently, and so that's always very important for perspectives. Um, we have a ways to go. 
um, to ensure that there is more diversity and inclusion. The State Department has been doing quite a bit to ensure that as the, uh, as the various levels of, um, of, of diplomats grow, um, they are being lifted and they have the opportunities to get lifted. Um, but it's, it's gonna take some time. Um, to, to get there, but definitely please come to my study group and um, we can talk about this a bit more. <laughs> Thank Thanks. So Thanks, Nadia. We'll go over here next. Hi, uh, my name's Joshua. I'm a senior at the college studying applied math and my question is actually to the two councils who are fellows this semester uh, and it's specifically about the increasing politi politicization of the legal system mm -hmm. and particularly if you guys uh, could provide some insight both into how you see this changing in the upcoming 2024 cycle? What will the mixture of legal uh, court battles and politics look like? And also a little bit about the appropriateness of using the courts in order to fight political battles and uh, uh, how best, when is it right and when is it not right to use the courts to fight these battles? I guess I'll go first. Um, and that's a fantastic question and, and something that I certainly deal with a lot. Uh, you know, there's no question that uh, the courtroom is now part of the political process, um, whether it's in Georgia, where there are lawsuits about, you know, what does it mean in state law when it says you can't start early voting uh, Saturday after a holiday? You know, and we went to court about that, right? And uh, that, that's, that, that, that's a huge thing because that affects, you know, how elections happen. And in certain cases, um, there's a competitive advantage to being on one side or the other of that outcome. Right, so th that, is, that is very high stakes. Um, as far as <clears throat> the politicization of, of courts itself, I think one thing I, I would kind of like to flag that, that maybe people don't think about a lot is uh, the prevalence of elected judges in this country and how, uh, how many lawsuits arise under state law that go through state court systems in, in states that really matter. Uh, Pennsylvania is the, is the one that immediately springs to mind. Um, in areas such as redistricting, they can have a massive effect on the political landscape. So if you don't know, in Pennsylvania, uh, it's elected judges, and you don't run as a judge with a lot of experience, you run as a Democrat, or you run as a Republican. And that's increasingly becoming a, a, a huge battleground now, too. Um, several of the, uh, a couple of years ago, the, the state Supreme Court, they're flipped, went from Republican to Democrat, uh, because the Democrats wisely put a lot of money into that and a couple of the judges running actually got up at an event and said that if they were, uh, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, okay, but, but to the effect that, um, you know, the, the, the Republican drawn map for congressional districts they felt was unconstitutional under state law and if they were voted into office they would, they would rule against that. In my view as an attorney, I think there's all sorts of legal issues with that and legal ethical issues with that, um, but you know who decides that is the state Supreme Court of the state, so they get to decide, right? And so a lawsuit was brought and they threw out the map and they picked one that shock upon shocks massively favored the Democratic Party. And it just is, right? That, that just, that's, just, that's part of the landscape now. So I think that's an answer to your question. But if I could do what she's doing, uh, you should definitely come to my study group and we'll talk more about this. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I would just add that there is a, a long history of um, candidates from both parties um, bringing suits following elections to uh, raise pr procedural and other issues. Um, the concern, I think, um, comes in where you see a, an uptick, a substantial uptick in the volume of those cases, which we, we have seen in recent years. Um, and you want to make sure that, that folks are bringing claims that are well-grounded and, and reasonable. Um, but I think it was heartening to see that um, in, the, in the last presidential election, um, judges who were appointed by both parties um, shared some consensus on the, uh, on the different claims that were brought to challenge the, uh, the 2020 election results. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll go up there. Uh, good evening, my name is Simeon. Uh, I'm a senior at the college. I study computer science and government. Um, we've been hearing a bit about division and increased division uh, in the United States. Uh, I think what was particularly interesting with the speaker election was that we're seeing more evidence of increased division within parties, not just inter-party. As we look forward to the next uh, presidential election, uh, is there any likelihood of a third party emerging and what might that look like in America? 
I mean, I'll take. I'll take. I don't. I don't. I don't think so. Uh, um, I, I think that we are, we are we're we're pretty locked in uh, where we are right now. Um, you know, that's not to say in some places where it's advantageous. I mean, there's a third party in Arizona, or there could be right now. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so so we're, we'll see how that plays out, and that's going to be particularly interesting when you talk about infighting in the party. Uh, yeah. Pretty pretty interesting uh, if if uh, the Congresswoman Cinema decides to go through with it and run Senator. as an independent. And um, so you know, I, I think. Um, uh, you know, it, it, it will be interesting in that state, but nationally, I, I really, it's hard for me to see a path for a third party uh, in, in national politics. I, I would agree. I do think we're seeing a lot of infighting, and, but it's not new. It's really not new, but there's such a huge reward, reward, right, for publicly throwing your team under the bus over and over and over again. Um, and so you reward weird behavior and people keep doing it, I guess. I don't know. I'm all for standing up to your leadership if there's a problem. Absolutely. But when it, it becomes this kind of circus, um, and, and my hope is that the voters do start to question, like, what's the value add? Okay, so you talk a lot, you're really popular, you know, you get all this clickbait. I can point to you extreme progressives and extreme conservatives who both do this. But when I think about their districts or their states, I'm like, what kind of service do you provide your people? Do you get anything done at home? Because I can tell you here, you pass no laws, you change no policy. So what's, I'm curious to see when the American electorate's gonna be tired of the, you know, we used to have a commercial young, many years ago, nobody's gonna remember this, but where's the beef? I'm curious when, and this was politically used, right? I'm curious when they're going to be like, where's the beef? Um, I would agree, though. I don't, I don't know that I see a third party. I, I think if Teddy Roosevelt couldn't pull it off, nobody can. <laughs> true. You know? yeah. and, That's and I, true. And I think the big difference, too, between us and, and you know, more parliamentary systems is uh, there, there's an advantage in policymaking, right? You can, you can play kingmaker uh, as a member of the Green Party um, in, in European countries. Uh, you can't do that here, yeah. right? It's a winner-take-all system. So I think the dynamic is just different. Where's the beef was 84 presidential, right? Yeah. I just want I, I'm getting old here. I'm getting real old. I remember that. Let's go over there. My name is Victor. I'm a sophomore at the college studying government and ethnicity, migration, and human rights. And I was hoping that this question could serve as your uh, individual pitches to community members, but particularly to students who are in the crowd. Uh, in just a few words, if you could each share what you hope students and uh, community members who attend your study groups get out of the experience. And uh, what do you personally hope to get out of the experience by being part of this community here at the Fellows and Study Groups program and at the Institute of Politics here at Harvard? Uh, I, can, I can start. Um, as far as, uh, and thank you for the great question. Um, as far as my uh, goals for, for the study group, um, my, mine focuses on um, congressional oversight and how Congress effectively and potentially ineffectively could use its powers. Um, I think um, given uh, the current threats to our democracy, it's a particularly important time for us to all be having a conversation about how to promote effective institutions within our government. And um, congressional oversight is really a fundamental responsibility of Congress, but I think for many people in the public, it's a bit of a black box. When people think about Congress, they think about legislation, which is also a very important function of Congress. Um, but, but congressional oversight is really fundamental to our system of checks and balances, um, you know, checking waste, fraud, and abuse by the executive branch, um, and um, you know, serving as a, a, a driver of how Congress um, understands gaps and deficiencies in laws, laws that affect people more broadly. Um, so I think it's really important um, to have a dialogue between Congress and the public about how to most effectively use those powers. So I, I hope to, to um, you know, promote that kind of dialogue in these um, study group discussions and, and hope that it'll spur additional interests among those of you who attend. Um, and then just personally, um, you know, selfishly, I love talking about um, these issues. I love talking about politics with students. And I know that I'm gonna be learning a lot from these discussions. So um, I, I really look forward to to the dialogue. Did you want to hear from the whole group? Ideally, but if we're short for time. If people could, could answer the question, but 
brevity is important. So I can go next. I can go very quickly. Um, look, I, I think this, this study group should see, be seen as a complement to any other courses you are taking as it relates to, to foreign policy, national security, international relations. The idea is to talk about some of the other topics um, that don't necessarily make it into the textbooks just yet. It usually takes a really long time for something to hit into an academic book, but it's what are we contending with right now and what are practitioners really thinking through? And it's all the other sort of fun dynamics and fun conversations, um, here, whether it's hearing from me, hearing from others who are practitioners um, today and how they're dealing with these issues. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at misinfo and disinfo and what does that mean? What does cybersecurity mean? And sort of it's being able to, to look at that. Um, you're, you're the future. Um, you're the future of, of how we're going to look at um, policy and politics and, and national security and what are those perspectives. That's, that's what I'm excited about. I'm hoping for that two-way dialogue um, and, and debate and to learn more of sort of what's actually um, of interest uh, to you and, and to your, your fellow um, classmates. Um, I am, so I want two things. I want people to understand that you can be a radical moderate, which means you can be passionate about your issues and you can defend those with vigor, but the moderate approach has to do with how you're gonna interact with people. Doesn't mean you give up on the things that are most important to you that drive you. But I wanna equip you with the ability to take that thing that you are passionate about, the thing you wanna change, and actually see change. I don't want you to waste your time and spin your wheels being the hot topic of the day, but that will pass. And then who are you, what do you do? I can, again, we can point to people who do this right now. I want you to be effective. Um, because I think each of you has something to bring and to bear. And my experience was you have to uncork that. You find that along the way. I want to also, if you are interested in running for office, I'd love to, to help share with you. I had to invite myself to the party, so to speak, and I had to open those doors on my own, and I didn't have a path. And so I'd love to share with you what that path can look like um, and inspire you in that. And for my purposes, you might see me and my kiddos wandering around your amazing campus, looking at the history. I mean, I will have on sweatpants and my hair will be in a ponytail, but I just want to experience this, you know, I've, we've never been to Boston, uh, and my kids wanted to see the Freedom Trail, and some, yes, they're those kind of kids. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to get the experience that you guys get to live in. That's such a tiny little slice for the rest of us. I just wanted to have that, so thanks. Uh, yeah, I'll be very quick. I mean, you know, what I hope that you get out of my study group is, you know, how to run a modern day campaign. And, you know, essentially in my definition of that is that there are fundamentals to campaigns that I think all good ones have. Uh, but at the end of the day, a modern day campaign does what it takes to win. Uh, and, you know, from my most recent experience in Georgia, that meant really going after Republican and independent voters to the extent that it was uncomfortable for my base. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but it worked, right? And I think that we just, you know, campaigns are a luxury and people don't often get an opportunity to do them twice. Uh, that's the one thing that's unique about Senator Warnock. He did it in 2020 and then he had to do it again in 2022. And so we sort of knew, you know, we had little hints and peaks that like, there's something here, we could expose this. And then, you know, when, when you get a candidate like Herschel Walker, you know, a, a different operative or a different campaign manager might have said, look, Republicans are going to vote for this guy. Let's just go full bore liberal and turn out our base and let's see what we can do. Uh, we didn't. I said, let's stop. Uh, I want to go talk to those people who aren't going to vote for him and get them to vote for, for, for my guy. Uh, and so, you know, doing whatever it takes to win. Uh, and then for me personally, you know, I'm, I, 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 don't, I don't feel old, but I've been doing campaigns for a while now. I'm 33. Uh, but I, I want to learn, right? Like, I, I want to you know, learn from you guys and, and sort of touch back a little bit. I think that it's very easy, especially depending on where you live, to fall into a place of where you quickly sort of forget or you lose that thing that sort of makes you uh, understand the electorate and understand that that may not be where it is and, you know, everywhere is different. And so I'm hoping to get that from this community about what you guys care about and sort of what I can take back and apply to the next campaign that I do. Yeah, and I think so many of these, these study groups really dovetail nicely together because you're obviously a campaign operative. And I've had a, a 
experienced more like that on my side too. I mean, in, in 2016, I was the general counsel of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, which does all the U.S. Senate campaigns on the Republican side. And it's much more of a campaign-focused body than, than the RNC is. I thought I knew what the RNC was about until I went there and, and realized that there was a whole lot that I didn't know. Um, and I think, you know, right now we are in a, a what I would consider a really transformative era for political parties as a whole, which is really the focus of, of my study group, uh, number one. Number two, I think very few people actually understand the mechanics of that and what that looks like. And so when you talk about, well, the Republicans are doing this, the Democrats are doing this, like, what does that mean? I think most people think it's this kind of, you know, blob of, you know, thought or something happening somewhere in a vacuum, and, and it's not. It's, it's, it's people. It's people showing up and doing work. It's people having disagreements, sometimes very public disagreements. Um, but ultimately, um, working together to advance the causes that, that, are, that are near and dear to their heart. So uh, that's what you're going to get out of me. We're going to talk about stuff like federal campaign finance law, which I know is exactly as riveting as it sounds, but it's really important to know, you know, how, I mean, we live in an environment where it sounds strange because as Americans we think, you know, First Amendment, free speech, but the truth is, is that political speech in this country is very highly regulated. Um, so in order to understand how parties work, you, you need to understand some of that. Um, we're going to talk about things like uh, debates. What should debates look like uh, for, for the presidential cycle, which is something I've been very closely involved with. Um, and, and so it's, it's going to be really fun. It's going to be a great opportunity uh, to learn more about those things. And then for me, selfishly, I mean, look, for the guys who are still in college, like, it's amazing how fast it goes by. And then I, I, I do feel old. Um, it's been a little longer for me. But uh, what an extraordinary opportunity to come back here. And like the congresswoman said, uh, to bring your family. My family's here. They're there. Hey, guys. The littlest one's, I think, watching Paw Patrol very quietly. Um, but... Uh, it's just it's a great opportunity to come here and be here in, in such an amazing community. So thank you all for, uh, thank you, Seti and the entire IOP mm -hmm. team for, for having me. When I was starting out in journalism, we were absolutely not encouraged uh, to cover things that were close to our own identity, lived experience. Um, I chose uh, to go against that grain very early, and it wasn't something that was necessarily um, supported. Uh, I freelanced for years in Iran before I got the job at the Washington Post. Washington Post gave me the job kind of reluctantly, and I was the only candidate for it. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, things changed uh, over time, and now I find myself in a situation where uh, my experience in Iran, my uh, experience as a political prisoner, as a hostage of a foreign government, uh, and as a journalist who um, has been under direct threat for the work that I do um, informs much of my reporting at this point. Um, and I've been able to cultivate these three separate beats, hostage, Iran, press freedom, uh, in, in a way that, um, you know, I, I don't like to toot horns, but, you know, has moved the needle on policy. And that's what we're going to talk about, how to to use your writing and, and your experience in life uh, to make a difference, um, whether it's through the media or, or through other avenues of public life. Uh, what I get out of this is the fact that, you know, I love nothing more than engaging with younger people. It teaches me about the things that a new generation of folks are interested in, things that might, um, might, might not be on my radar otherwise. Uh, I've, I've done uh, other fellowships at, at different universities. I speak at high schools a lot, uh, and it's really one of the joys uh, of my life at this point. Thank you all. Uh, Tenzin. Hi, everyone. My name's Tenzin, um, and I'm a first year at the college and a member of the JFK Junior Committee. Thank you, first of all, so much for being here today. Uh, my question is particularly with the forefronting of social media in our political world, whether that be campaigns in the United States or protests around the world, um, I was wondering what you all see as the future of oversight on that and the democratization of uh, social media to a greater extent to ensure that social media doesn't lead to some sort of increased tyranny, fascism, or censorship. Like to take that. I, I, I guess I can take that as somebody who's filed multiple complaints against big tech <laughs> people. Um, look, it is it is it is a real issue. But I think the question is, you know, sort of how do you view social media? Does social media have an obligation to police speech in this country? I think people have different views on that. Um, from the political party standpoint, from from my standpoint, I can tell you that, you know, and and again, we'll talk about this in our study group. So all of you should come. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah. We're going to talk about the role of tech and how it's been affecting party committees <laughs> and, and everything from how, uh, you know, having to communicate with folks. We talked about this a little bit. You know, uh, when you're having to communicate through social media, how does that affect the types of things you're saying? Does that contribute to toxicity of political discourse and things like that? Um, but also the fact that now there is a situation I don't know if we've ever had before where private uh, entities really do have a police power over free speech in this country. And it, it, it can be disturbing um, in ways you might not expect. We, um, I won't get into it too much here, but, but we're currently in litigation against uh, one massive tech company uh, who, like Clockwork, was, was shutting off our ability to send emails to donors at specific times of the month. And it was has been going on for several, several months in a row um, to the point where there's just no possible way it's innocent. You know, and, and, and okay, well then who's doing it? How's it happening? I mean, these are all questions to get into. Um, but I do, to answer your question, I do think it's, it, it's significant and I, I don't have the answer right now. I don't know if anybody does, but mm -hmm. it's something we all need to consider very deeply. Right, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Professor. Hi, I'm Jill Abramson. I've been on the Harvard faculty for nine years teaching journalism and writing uh, in the English department. And a lot of my students, I teach small seminars which are akin to your study groups about the same number of students and you know one I, I probably don't have to tell you this but one of the joys of being a fellow here is you will learn so much from the students and they are fearless about the questions they're going to ask you and I, I do have a question coming soon, but for the Washington members of this panel, I really encourage you, like say goodbye to careful Washington speak. Like th the kids, they have bullshit detectors like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> so, you know, talk true to them. Uh, and here are my questions, which are quick. One for Matthew, one for Kristen. Uh, for Matthew, I just wanted to follow up on the very smart question that the gentleman who was at this microphone before me asked, because mm -hmm. you immediately went to, you know, elected state court judges, but I think the basis of his question was focused more on the Supreme Court and, you know, what the consequences to democracy are that you have a, a five block majority now, all appointed by Republican presidents who vote a certain way, and ditto for, you know, the, 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 the liberal minority appointed by Democrats. And, you know, I don't, I think you, all of you know that the poll numbers for, you know, confidence and admiration for the Supreme Court have, have nosedived. And, you know, I guess for Matthew, I, I wondered, you know, does that concern you at all, that the, Supreme, the U.S. Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, is viewed as um, political now, where the judicial branch was always considered somewhat sequestered from politics? And Kristen, I'd be a rich woman if I had um, $10 for every oversight uh, committee investigation I either covered, I, I was the executive editor of the New York Times or, and the Washington Bureau of Chiefs, so I supervised a lot of coverage. And I want to ask you if you're concerned about Jim Jordan taking over the Oversight Committee. Uh, and, you know, he's announced, you know, some in, in, intentions to investigate that seem pretty far out there on, on the right. And you must be worried because that committee is such an important oversight on the executive branch uh, and occasionally other parts of gov government. So would you just hit the Supreme Court and would you talk about Jim Jordan taking over? <laughs> Well, I, uh, I a, have a pretty good bullshit detector too. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I, I, I think I think you know the notion of judicial review in this country, right, um, rests upon the idea that there are going to be judges who are 
kept out of the political fray. And we want judges to be out of the political fray as much as humanly possible. That's why they're given lifetime appointments, right? So that they're not worried about losing their job if they rule the wrong way in a certain way, which is why I personally think, it's a state-by-state -state thing, but the reason I went to uh, the, uh, the state judge issue is, is, is I do think it's concerning when you have people who are up for re-election and they're, you know, part, you know, partisan affiliations and things like that. I, I don't think that's what the role, this is again me speaking personally, uh, of, of, a, of a judge should be. Um, I think as far as, I think maybe it, the best way to answer this is, is, is to go to why is that now an issue? Why are people thinking about it? Uh, about, you know, judges being too partisan or things like that. Um, you know, we've gotten to a point in this country, and, and I, I think it started with Bork, although it might have predated that, where uh, judicial confirmations have become televised, highly partisan political affairs, and opportunities for one side to hit the other side uh, for political gain, right? And, um, I, I mean, t pick one, I mean, it, you know, from the last 20 years, and, and, and it's been a, a free-for-all. And it did not used to be that way. It used to be that the, you know, person who was picked had a you know, top ABA rating, and and uh, it was almost a foregone conclusion that whoever the president selected uh, would, would, would go through. But, you know, I, I think it is part of a, a larger trend of everything being political all the time now, which is just sort of a fact, so. How about Jim Jordan? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for the great advice. <laughs> I'll try to follow it. Um, <laughs> the House Committee on Oversight is a tremendously powerful committee. It was uh, a committee on which I had the privilege of serving as a counsel for over 15 years. And you know, as, as I mentioned in, in my comments earlier, I, I have had the privilege of seeing that authority used um, in a really bipartisan way and, and in a way that has made a tremendously positive impact. And I've also, um, you know, when my, the first investigation that I, I worked on was in the late 90s and, and um, over a thousand subpoenas were issued by the then chair, 98% of which targeted um, alleged democratic abuses. So it was very skewed one way um, during that investigation among some others. So um, I think, you know, we should all um, be um, uh, interested in how the powers of that committee are employed. Um, I think when we're talking about um, wanting to have civil discourse, the starting point should be we don't presume uh, ill intentions, and we're mm -hmm. just at the start of the the new Congress. So it, it has, you know, it, it remains to be seen how all the chairs will employ the tremendous powers that they, that they have. But this is another reason to come to my study group yeah. because <laughs> we will be looking at these issues in real time and, um, and talking about are, are, are the chairs using their powers appropriately or um, are there more effective ways they could be using them? Um, I, let, me, let me add really quickly. Okay. There's no reason to be afraid of any of them, partially because um, we are in a divided government. So even if things get out of the House and they're, whether they're talking point pieces or they're real legislative pieces, you know, for whatever purpose, um, it, I think it will serve as, as good learning <laughs> uh, and good opportunities to dissect why are they doing that? What's the purpose? What are they hoping to gain? Is it, being, is it effective on the American people? Because obviously some of these are going to be political moves. But remember, we, the Senate is in, uh, you know, the House and the Senate are divided. So it's not something, I, I would just want to, because you use the word fear. It is not something to fear. And, and I think uh, you'll have a lot elucidated about the good, the bad, and the ugly with these investigations with Kristen's, Kristen's discussion group. Thanks. Great, well, we're gonna have to wrap up. I know there was one more question up there, but the good news is that you can go to their study groups to ask them <laughs> any questions you want. Um, you know, after listening to these remarkable people and thinking about what is happening in the world, what's happening in the United States, there's no better group to be here to engage with us, to educate us, and for you to educate and learn something from them. So really excited to have you here. Thank you so much. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your evening. Stay warm. <laughs>